you are watching your favorite science fiction show. And they have mandatory time travel episode. Our heroes usually go to modern day Earth. Why? Well, the show has spent all the money to cast fun favorite star. Something as big as Enterprise in low Earth orbit is a quite noticeable feature even with Mark 1 eyeballs. Usually our heroes are using some kind of magical cloaking devices, and in some cases they park him on the spaceship behind the moon. And this science fiction trope is the most interesting one. It looks like a plausible explanation rooted in real science. Question here, is it even possible? Well, in Newtonian physics universe. Spacecraft need to stay in stable orbit behind the moon. This in theory allow to hide from airbound optical observations. Or maybe it is not. So join me on a journey where I use Kerbal Space Program to answer this question. This simulation game is as close to real-world orbital mechanics as normal people can get. Well, without becoming a real scientist. Nevertheless, Kerbal Space Program is a rather simple game. For the sake of performance and simplicity, KSP is shortcutting majority of orbital mechanics. Every single celestial body in KSP has sphere of influence. This resemble gravitational spheres of influence as they explained in real life. In Kerbal Space Program, once you are in celestial body sphere of influence, you are only affected by one single celestial body. When in real life, other celestial bodies still exert lesser gravitational pull. This alone makes for some interesting real-world interactions. For example, there are five Lagrange points. Points where gravity of several celestial bodies cancel each other out. Points where a spacecraft relative to other two celestial bodies is somewhat fixed in place. Second Lagrange point of Moon looks like just a hidden and secret orbit. If you are writing time travel episode based on Wikipedia pictures, this is your inspiration and you will look really smart. In vanilla KSP, L2 point is not accessible. Nevertheless, just like we can add visual modes to make KSP1 look better, we can install mod called Principia and have all and body interactions, including Lagrange points. And while I fail with my English language, Time to launch MAN L2 Point Space Station in Carol Space Program. We are not making Enterprise Time Travel episode, we are launching things from Carrion, so let's make something interesting in terms of gameplay backstory. Let's say there is a space race going on, and one of the sides decide to put super duper secret space station behind the MAN. Station would hide and do some naughty science while nobody watching. Yeah, this is unacceptable, let's do this. <laughs> let's say our brave Kerbos never launched a satellite into this orbit. And then they want to determine is hiding behind the moon even possible. Yeah, practical crew spaceflight in its finest. If you think about real life, L1, L2 and L3 Lagrange points, they are unstable. Only stable Lagrange points are L4 and L5 that are 60 degrees behind and up front from orbiting celestial body. For example, Jupiter have quite a big amount of L4 and L5 asteroids, some of which are like 10 times the size of Mars, Moons, Deimos and Phobos. By conventions, they are each named after Greek mythology, after a figure of Trojan War, hence the name Trojans and Greeks. And the most awesome science fiction depiction of L4 and L5 points we can find in modern day Battlestar Galactica. Gas Giant of Hestia have Cancer and Erlon in L4 and L5 points, of its orbit. And they are both habitable worlds, not entirely realistic because they are just too big for this size of the gas giant, but then the whole double binary star system with 12 major habitable worlds, well, this just screams some artificial stellar forming. And it is quite fitting with the theme of divine intervention and biblical tale of Battlestar Galactica. Nevertheless, while in real life we only observe L4 and L5 natural objects, in L1, L2 and L3 point orbits, well, we never see actually any natural satellites there because, well, eventually they will escape. So unless we are doing some practical control space flight, we could not really put something natural in these orbits. As a launch vehicle, I am using one of my SSTOs to make a simple space station from two modules. Uh, first to go is propulsion and habitation module. Uh, launch system is slightly modified space shuttle from my perfectly balanced space shuttle video. And after getting to something around like 300 km orbit, I changed the inclination to much equatorial plane to simplify the moon transfer later. This is actually the first time when I'm using Principia ever. Uh, things are quite different from the vanilla KSP and the whole targeting system is just gone and you need to keep like close attention to the frames of reference. 
A lot of things went down not really in a perfect fashion. For example, the whole re-entry, it was way off from desired landing spot. I was juggling around with trajectories mod. Surprisingly, it works just fine, it's just me not using it correctly. Also, my modifications to previously perfectly balanced faceplane, they were not so perfect. So, after getting to dense part of atmosphere, craft just lost control. It was definitely too stern heavy. Fix is rather simple, just shift center of mass with fuel. And I kinda sort of fixed the issue and made landing in one piece possible. Uh, but it was still way off from how this craft should handle. All the way down to a runway, I was combating space plane desire to pitch the nose up. Nevertheless, things like this just makes you feel alive. You know, like the thrill of supper landing on a poorly designed space plane is just a part of KSP gameplay at this point. Launch number two was on a slightly altered space plane. While I fixed the stern heavy craft to make landing easier, now it's too heavy on the bow, that makes takeoff and stable ascent a bit harder. Until supersonic speed is achieved, space plane try to pitch down naturally and try to roll. When you try to roll, it's also result in pitching down, so it's yeah, a bit harder to handle when you just start your flight, but once you get to supersonic speed, it's just nice and Gucci. While second SSO do the ascent, let's reference the mod list that I'm using. Often requested in the comments, so if you find this helpful, leave the comment down below. Or I'm losing free engagement. Yeah, sometime making video better make it worse for YouTube algorithm. Yeah, but I'm still doing this. Here's the full list on your screen. Quite a simple KSP build, a bunch of visual enhancements with waterfall, EVE, scatter, and every single Spectra add-on. Spectra is providing configs for EVE and scatter, so no stock configs for these two mods required. On the gameplay side, we have MacJab, Principia, Docking Port Alignment Indicator, and Trajectories. And for the new parts, I'm using Near Future Solar. There are a couple small bits like Nebula Skybox and Free IVA, but they are more of a flare than something substantial. Loading times are blazing fast, not like my KSP build from this video, that loads for like unacceptable 2 minutes. With the second launch, it was time to make my first rendezvous in Principia. Before that, I have reassembled the spacecraft, science model have unfoldable scanner and telescope arrays, and the whole thing can dock to bow docking port of a space plane. And this will streamline the rendezvous and docking later. A rendezvous was pretty normal, well outside of me failing for 15 minutes to find button to target other vessel, but you know, UI and especially mod UI is always, uh, well, a challenge. Uh, also, there's like something like with Principia transfers, it feels a bit off, I don't know what exactly, maybe something to do with other celestial bodies exerting gravity, I have no idea, but I felt like I have spent double amount of Delta V. Uh, the map view reference points in Principia are quite bizarre. Yes, they are logical, well, from realism standpoints, you actually you are going in the loops around the object when you're on the way with it. Nevertheless, for like my monkey brain, it was confusing as heck, <laughs> so I just reverted to good old turn target then kill off relative velocity by burning retrograde target. Then again burn target, then retrograde target. And once you do it several times, you will just reach acceptable distance and dock. Docking was super easy, and after that, the small space walk was in order. I have slapped one extra science module and extra communication array, and it was time to unfold radiators, scanner, and main solar arrays. With the station ready, it was time to depart to a man secret orbit. And here where the game have failed quite a bit. By the game, uh, my vessel have like no engines or zero TVR, and this forced all my maneuver planning just to be eyeballed on the time axis. Yep, quite the fun to play first time Principia and eyeball things like man transfer. Nevertheless, it was the first time when I was witnessing the whole web of orbital trajectories. And this is quite the show. These orbits evolving around each other, they actually reminds me of this circular children drawing toy. And this is pretty much the same principle that you have with two points in space and gravity that are orbiting each other, only one is on a stellar scale and other one is just a piece of plastic made in China. Although mine was probably made in Soviet Union. Wait a second, wait a second. Okay, now I have googled it and this thing is called Spifograph or Spifograph. I have no idea how it's pronounced. And it was developed by British engineer Dennis Fisher. And from what I can gather, this child toy was developed by him in 1962, 
while designing weapons for NATO. Yeah. But later he became designer of a bunch of board games, so yeah, space and military stuff, you never know how it will integrate into our society. After getting somewhat close to Man, I have made second correction burn. Definitely the result of me eyeballing things. Nevertheless, this station have like 10k delta V, so I'm pretty much free with amount of orbital corrections. And idea of getting to L2 point is to get slingshot trajectory and then slow down in Man Periapsis. And this is quite a small window. Once you see the loop behind the Man, it is the L2 orbit. Also, me eyeballing things felt a bit at first. So I got into Man Shadow, so my L2 injections was made into Burns, it was quite close. You can notice also other thing, it looks a bit fishy, you know? It's not a point, it's an orbit! While the whole thing is called Lagrange point, it is a literal orbit, and this orbit is unstable. So naturally, spacecraft that caught in this orbit will escape after several revolutions. And what happens here is that Man gives a small gravitational slingshot to a passing spacecraft. Every single orbit at Man periapsis, spacecraft need to slow down for the next revolution. As you can see with your own eyes, the orbit is quite huge. A revolution takes something about 6 or 7 days, and the amount of space covered by this orbit is 10 times the size of Man. And here is the footage how it looks from the spacecraft point of view. Does not look like spacecraft is hidden 90% of the time in L2 point. So here goes our science fiction trope. Or does it not? Wait a second. Here we have something not to scale, like Earth and Moon. Maybe the size matters. Well, not really. L2 point orbit is also called a halo orbit. And guess what? We have real satellites there. And they are actually communicating directly to the Earth's surface. Also, this is one of the tools to make stable communication with the far side of the Moon. So, the L2 point from the Earth Observer, well, uh, your spacecraft will just pop from the size of Moon for the quite substantial periods of time. While it's not really noticeable with Mark 1 eyeballs, well, anything decent that is pointed to Moon, or Moon, whatever, <laughs> it will just spot your several hundred meter spacecraft. Especially if it's something like Star Destroyer, like several kilometers long. Well, ah, no, 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 no. The next question here, can we literally hover over the surface of Moon instead of parking in this L2 orbit. From what my limited orbital knowledge can fathom, well, we need to combat two forces. First, we will need to constantly output orbital speed of Lagrange point relative to Moon, so we will actually stay in one place and we will not pop out on the sides of the Moon, and then we need to produce continuous escape velocity of Moon not to fall down. And in the key speed is in the ballpark of 150 meters per second. Real life things, they are way bigger, like 10 times bigger. So we are talking about more than a kilometer per second of delta V, exerted indefinitely, every single second. Quite a lot of delta V and TBR. Can the spaceship from science fiction actually produce such amount of thrust outside of FTL drives? If you are talking about something at least rooted in real Newtonian physics, like expansive show and book series, well, it looks unrealistic. Quote, when the resonance escapes from the donager, Alex does a high G burn of 5G or more for 10 or 11 hours. This would leave the ship flying at 1800 km per second or more, 0.6% of speed of light or 50 to 100 times the escape velocity of the solar system at this point in space. So we are talking about 36,000 seconds of time divided by final speed of 1,800 km per second. This leaves us at the acceleration of 1 km per second every 20 seconds. This is not enough to meet acceleration of 1 km per second to stay in one place above the moon. And well, outside of constant 5G, you will have the heat buildup and will consume fuel. 5G is pretty much maximum that human heart can handle during prolonged periods of time. So anything accelerating faster will basically kill any healthy grown-up human. Our small hiding stunt in Expanse is basically impossible. But what about something less real like Star Trek and Star Wars? They have internal dampeners, artificial gravity, and something with seemingly unlimited power and fuel. Star Trek have its impulse engines, and here's a quote. The Star Trek Voyager technical manual, page 13, has full impulse listed as a quarter of the speed of light, which is this number in, well, Imperial, and this one in metric. One quarter of an impulse of Voyager would be 18,665 km per second. 
Uh, this is quite a lot of trust. Technically, this fits into our acceleration requirement. But then I have like a lot of questions then. In 4 seconds on full impulse, Voyager can accelerate to a speed of light? This sentence alone makes any battle scene in Star Trek ridiculously slow and out of place. Yeah. Alright, long story short. In fantasy science fiction, like Star Trek and Star Wars, well, you can come up with any number even if it contradicts what is shown on a screen. With this video I sort of answered the question about hiding in Lagrange points, totally impossible. At the same time I just opened the whole can of worms called sublight engines in science fiction. Is there any place where you can actually hide your spacecraft in the Earth's sky? There is actually one single place, which called, well, geostationary orbit above Pacific Ocean. There is like whole hemisphere covered in water with minimal population, so yeah, observations will be minimal, uh, but still people from Hawaii can see you, so yeah. And here is the future Yakis, uh, I slept over on the idea, I have my morning coffee, I'm editing this video, and now I have, well, why you even bother with L2 points and actually putting yourself in synchronous orbits and stuff, where you can just go to the suborbital trajectory, so you are on the collision course, and just hovering by not landing. Uh, this is kind of the way to hide behind the moon, but then the biggest question there, why you just didn't land on the surface of the moon and just fix the whole issue. Uh, it's actually way easier than you think, just forget about L2 points and that's it. Another thing, well, if you are using like space shuttles, beam and tech, why you just didn't land in Antarctica? There's like no one living there, nobody will spot you. I hope your brain does not hurt like mine. Have a nice one. And Yakis, out!